Hey, how's it going? Welcome to the Building Blocks of Bass. Take my headphones off, I don't need those right now. Hey, welcome to the Building Blocks of Bass. My name is Bob Debu. Happy Monday, glad to be here. We've got a fun one scheduled for today. We're going to get into some Ray Brown, who I don't think we've talked about yet in these... Uh... Going to get into some Ray Brown. I don't think we've talked about uh, any Ray just yet. Uh, sorry, I've got all kinds of technical issues going on, but you can hear me okay, right? Cool. So welcome to the Building Blocks of Bass. Uh, again, my name is Bob Debu. Super glad to be here on Monday. Um, and we're going to check out Ray Brown's Blues in the Basement today. It's going to be super fun, and I want to put up, put up the album cover just because I love this so much. It's from an album particularly uh, that's so, so swinging with Milt Jackson and Ray Brown. So it's from Shelley's, live at Shelley's Manhole, and the album is called That's the Way It Is. So that's the, that's the cover to that, and I've got a nice picture of Milt, Milt with, with Ray Brown back there when they were youngsters. So how cool is that, right? So I remember one of, I have to relay a really quick Ray Brown story. When I was 18 and getting ready to check out schools, we would, uh, my dad and I took a trip to New York and was able to, to catch Ray Brown, uh, the Ray Brown trio, two nights in a row at the Blue Note. Uh, which for me was just like, man, that's that, how cool is that? But um, one night was with Diana Krall singing, Kareem Wiggins was playing drums, and Jeffrey Keezer was playing piano, and they were playing both nights. But one night was Diana Krall, and the next night was Dee Dee Bridgewater. Um, and we, so we went two nights in a row to see Ray Brown, which just completely changed my life. Um, and um, the first night was incredible, because I ended up sitting with my father, at the table right up front, and we were sitting at the same table with Milt Jackson, Milt's wife, Bob Cranshaw, and Bob Cranshaw's wife. I mean, let alone we're front seat, you know, talking, you know, like listening to Ray Brown, which hearing him live, just, oh man. Um, but then, you know, like after, after these uh, gigs with Dee Dee Bridgewater and Diana Krall, the very tall band was going to get together, and so Milt Jackson was going to play, uh, you know, the next the next few nights, and I think they made a recording of these sessions too. So, so very very cool, right? Um, so again, welcome to the Building Blocks of Bass. I want to give a shout out real quick. I have a new course for sale. This is my uh, my course over on OpenStudioJazz.com, and for there's some Black Friday sales going on too. So right now you can choose what you pay on the courses that are up especially the bass courses too. So Christian McBride's course, great courses, and uh, Ruben Rogers, Rogers, excuse me, course, uh, and, uh, and mine as well. So typically it's, it's 77 bucks, but I think you can, you can choose whether it's 50, whether it's 30, whatever your, whatever your level is at, go and check out the course. Okay, so um, without further ado, I wanted to get into some of Blues in the Basement, okay? So there's a lot, this is a, a bass written like from the, this is a blues written from the bass, no doubt about it. There's a lot of open strings in it, a lot of double stops, and you can click the link down below to get a full sheet of the, uh, the worksheet that I'm using today. Uh, so I've transcribed this from that album the way it is, and uh, we're just gonna do the melody today because there's quite a lot, and it's very bass centric, as I said earlier, it's very bass centric, and uh, we're gonna talk about some, some just fun bassy type of stuff today. So let's look, let's, let's hear it first. I'm just going to play the, the melody. And it's about at this tempo, um, I think I had it at, uh, what are we at? So this is 80, so 160 for beats 2 and 4. And I'll just set it on 2 and 4 for right now, okay? Uh, and please, leave comments, questions, anything, anything you want to talk about over there, okay? So this is an E blues, and this is Ray's blues in the basement. I'm going to play it, and then we'll break it down a little bit and practice it together, okay? One, two, uh, uh. Thank you. 
it's just a fun, fun melody to jam on. It's got some double stops in there, some open strings. So we can do everything like all in the moment together, which is, uh, which is really cool. And there's a, a section at the end of it. If you're familiar with the recording, you know it doesn't stay in E. Actually, Ray transitions into a G blues, and they just, they just hit the ground running, like swinging right afterwards with sax solo. Um, and it's super good. But let's check out the melody, which is just started by Ray. Uh, Ray plays it down the first time, and then the drums come in with the two and four. Uh, but let's look at the first, the first four measures of it, okay? So, as I said, it's an E, which is perfect for the bass, right? E, A, D, G, our open strings, um, can uh, really help us play the roots as the roots progress or as the blues progresses. So the, uh, the open strings, you know, they're already there for us, especially the open E. So we look here, we've got this E, and we can let it ring, right, to get that root note. And that frees us up to play. Now this may be, may look crazy if you're not too familiar, like if you're not too familiar with reading music or whatever, or with double stops. This is the third and the seventh of E7. So we've got E7 here. On top is a G sharp, which is the third, and then D is underneath it, which is the seventh, of course, right? So it's a uh, we're playing the shell of an E7 chord. And I, it's a tritone, right? Which is this, that siren type of sound, or YYZ if you're inclined. Um, which is, uh, I, won't, I won't digress. I won't, I won't start talking about Rush or uh, Primus, which is actually the first time I heard that was from Primus. Um, but we're talking about Ray Brown, right? So this, this double stop right here, and this is the really key to this melody, is these are these double stops that are up top. It would be something like that maybe a pianist would do, uh, but we can do it on the bass because the root is freeing us up with the open strings. So what he's doing, and if you listen to the recording too, I'm, I've been playing it this way, where you can just strum across two strings at once really quickly, but he may be doing it this way, like plucking, uh, strumming it with his thumb. Or maybe the, I don't think he's using it. I need some rail files that would know that answer to hop on and let me know in the comments, okay? But the notes that he's playing is definitely this. So he's playing the, the, the third on top and the seventh underneath, and then raising that by a half step, going in and out really quick, right? Which is very common, you know, to, to shift these dominant seven chords by like a half step up or down, just to give it some motion. So. Um, so it's, that's the main, those two bars are really the main part of the, of this melody until we get to like the, the B section, uh, so, the, we, until we get further on. So this rhythm is going to repeat a bunch. So we play that line. And then he plays a fill leading back into the E7. And this is particularly important too, because it's going to an E7. The next four bars is E7 again, but he's setting himself up. He's playing, he's being a bassist for himself, right? And he's playing A, B flat, B. And that B is super important because it's the fifth leading us back into E. So he plays this. segues perfectly you know like to get us back to that E7 okay so that's that's uh, that's what's going on with this melody and as it repeats those little fills at the end kind of change around too so you can find all of this again on the click the link down below and you can download this worksheet if you don't like seeing it you know on the, on the screen the way that it is here so this is the next four bars okay and it's practically identical right again we've got uh, sorry I'm trying to turn this off We've got, again, the third and the seventh on top, this little shell. And you'll hear a bunch of bass players do this. I was just listening to Christian McBride play something like this on, um, on Red Cross. If anybody knows that album with Roy Hargrove and Stephen Scott, um, which is called Parker's Mood, I think. Uh, he plays a, a completely solo piece of Red Cross, which is a, like a rhythm changes type of tune. And he'll do... So that third and seventh type of thing, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of ubiquitous on the bass in jazz world. So, so we've got this G sharp, 
fingering wise, I tend to go this this route where I'm playing my ring finger on G sharp and my uh, middle finger on the D. You could do it uh, this way too, where you've got second finger on top and first finger on the bottom. This is kind of the trickiest part of this melody, getting into that register, playing the note simultaneously. If you're not too used to doing that, that could be a you know a chore that you're not from, as familiar with. And then the intonation. So we're kind of up there. So make sure you've got like good ears ears going on. Find this G sharp. So that's what we're looking for. So anyways, here is the second four bars now. You notice it's the same except for where it's going. So after we hit this, this is our second four, we're going to go to an A7. So notice how Ray sets this up. He's doing a chromatic walk up to A. So he'll do for this, for this four bars. So there's no doubt like where he's heading. He's heading to the four chord there, right? So let's check that out real quick, all right? So the same thing is happening now um, as far as the rhythm goes or like the main like motive of this of this blues is this hitting the root da 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 ba. Now here we're seeing still thirds and seventh on the top, but instead of the third being the highest note, remember on E it was G sharp and D. Well that flips around when we go to the four chord. Or if we if we move, if we progress in that uh, in that fourth and keep the dominant seventh kind of shell, this happens. So now if we move to A, we'll do the same thing, just down a half step. So it's no longer the third on top, now it's the seventh. So G is on top, C sharp is underneath it. So that way we have like a chord, an all together chord on the upright bass, right? So, and then he moves that up a half step. Again, here is our, he's putting a five in front of the upcoming chord, which is that E7, right? So that's a very important, like, bass-centric type of thing to notice in this melody, too. There's so much going on in this that, I mean, as far as, like, doing his role as a bass player and then playing the melody, establishing the groove is just, I mean, from the get-go, it's, like, super grooving. So let's try this, let's try this line out a few, a few times. Again, I got my metronome set at 80, just for two and four. One, two, one, two, three, four. That's where that's heading, it's back to an E, right? Let's try this line again. One, two, one, two, three. Right? Cool. So let's see if we can go, let's do the first, um, everything that we've learned up to this point, and just try to groove on that together, okay, for a while. Okay, so we're gonna do E for four bars, E for four bars, and then the A line for four bars. And then we'll see what's up next, okay? One, two, one, two, three. Oh. Now heading to the four chord. gets us back to that E again, where the line is going to repeat, right? Except that we've got a little bit of a difference. So this is four bars of E, four bars of E, then A7, then E7 again, and then in the bridge, uh, not the bridge, but like the next section of the blues, we would head to either the two chord or the five chord. And what's coming up is the five chord. So we've got this E7 happening here, the same thing, the double stops, moving that around a little bit. Uh, doing the half step bounce thing and then what he's setting up for the next chord that's coming up is we're heading to the five chord so of course he sets himself up boom, ding, chromatically getting to that five chord right so everything is cohesive right so if we play this line boom, boom, dun, dun, that's that five chord in the blues right so Let's, let's play all of that up together, okay? And I'm not gonna use a metronome now, let's just try to feel this, okay? If you've got your bass, play it with me. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. Right? 
So as long as that's feeling good, and that, I mean, at this point, this is only thing that's happening in the track, right? He'll repeat, he'll repeat this melody, and then the drums will enter, and then they, as I said, they they switch keys. They go into a G blues, but because this is like a bass, this is in the basement. That's that's why it's in this key because we have these open strings E A, and the five is right next door to that, right? So let's check out the next section. All right. Again, you can find all of this in the link down below if you would like a sheet for it. Uh, it's free. You just have to sign in. Go check it out. Okay. Uh, also, please consider joining the Facebook group, the Building Blocks of Bass. Uh, a lot of bass players in there. We just like you know we can talk about what we do in these sessions, have uh, suggestions for any upcoming session ideas. I'm all ears. We're just here to talk about bass and to get better. So anything uh, related to that topic is all good in the Facebook group. So now let's look at this. This is where we deviate from that 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 main riff that's going on. Um, and basically we're he's he's hitting the fifth right. So here we are at B seven. But the melody is not so B7-ish, right? It sounds more like a like he's hitting some, some E blues, right? So in the melody itself, it sounds like, especially right here, it sounds like he's imparting just the, the blues in E and not shifting. You know, he's not trying to move into like a B7 type of motif. He's not playing a D sharp, for instance. He's not playing, you know, F sharp on top. He's not outlining that chord. He is playing the B7, but implying this uh, this E blues that's going on, right? So that's where we get this line. Right. So he sets himself up. Here's our five chord for two bars. He sets himself up into the four chord, hitting the root, and then the seventh. Or that, or the the minor third, like one of the blue notes in the in that sound, right? That type of job. So let's play this in time. Let's check it out. So we're gonna hit B down here. Remember, we're coming from that E. That that shape. Now we're gonna hit B, and then really quick jump up to this E natural on beat two. One, two, one, two, three, four. Right, and he's definitely doing, I mean, just listen to the recording. It's, that's the easiest way to explain what's happening here uh, for these G's that are up here. He's sliding up into them and, and putting a thing on them that way. Sliding in and sliding back out of them. With a real quick five again because we're heading back to E. The whole thing is in E, right? So it sounds, this note is a little suspect. And on a repeat, some of these at the end of each, like four bars, eight bars, is a little bit different. Um, but that's not really a, a big deal. Uh, but again, he's setting up, we're heading to the five chord by this B natural at the end. So let's try this through a few times, all right? Try it out with me. One, two, one, two, three, four. Let's try that much again. You ready? One, two, one, two, three, go. And that's where that's heading, right? So let's try this whole melody now. Now, if you would like to see it, of course, just click the link down below and you can download it. I'm not going to put it back up on the screen, but it's a fairly simplistic melody, especially once you've heard it makes a lot of sense. So let's try it through a few times, okay? We'll do it, actually let's do it through once and I'm going to talk about how Ray modulates into the next key, which is super hip. He's using even more of these open strings. So I want to get there, but before we do that, let's make sure we've got the melody down. And you can always, too, go back and re-watch these videos, pause, check them back out if you want to see anything we'll be doing fingering-wise. Uh, if you have any questions about fingerings, head over to the comments. We're going to check that out after we've shedded this a little bit more. All good? All right, let's try it. Let's try blues in the basement. So you might want to find that G sharp first before we play. The open E should be no problem, right? As long as your bass is in tune. One, two, one, two, three, go.
that would actually technically be the top. Um, so he does, he'll go back to that E for another four bars at the end there. And then we're back at the top. So you can hear Ray like uttering some stuff during the performance and the drums enter at that next time, right? So let's, let's try all that again, because I could definitely work on that, especially I'm trying to think about my sound with these double stops. It's not sounding the way that Ray does it right now, for sure. It sounds to me like he's got like more like this. Maybe he is. But I, that's, that's probably what's happening too. I don't know, it's hard to tell. But if you listen to the recording, let me know what you think. Uh, there's not a video that I know of of this performance, so we can't go to that. But just use your ears. It's definitely not him like plucking super hard as if he was walking a bass line. It's got that lighter type of comping type of vibe to it. Some type of walk back that is definitely not something that Ray Brown. I don't know where that came from, but he would definitely do that more likely that line and not the the BS I was just doing. So, all right. So, um, and again, this whole sheet you don't have to see it in the sections that I'm putting up online, but uh, but that's that's the, the idea. So now I wanted to get into the next bit, and of course, like I was saying, any comments, any questions, criticisms, whatever. Let me know. If you're just joining us, I want to put on a little inspirational photography. This is Ray Brown playing with Milt Jackson when they were youngins. I wonder, they must be in their 20s there, you think? And this is the album cover that we're, that we're checking out today. So this is from the Milt Jackson Quintet featuring Ray Brown. That's the way it is. There's some great, great cuts on this album. It's so swinging. Do Frankie and Johnny on this one. It's super good. Yeah. Um, check out that album. Let me know what you think if you've not heard it. So swinging. So now here is what happens, and this is kind of like awkward to look at, but this is like what in the sheet that I provided is like the second ending. So here's the last four of what would regularly be the melody, except Ray is now moving through the cycle of fourths. He's starting in A, I'm sorry, he's in E, and then he'll jump up a fourth to A7, and then he's going to like further down, that second line down there, excuse me, he's hitting a D7, which is setting us up for that G blues that's coming up next, okay? So E, A, D, and of course they're heading to G, so it's kind of like a bass nerdy joke built into the whole song itself, right? Like, so he's in E, transitions to A, D7, and then finally they swing it out in G7, and he transitions back into the key of E to play the melody out further down the road. But this is really hip how he gets there. So here's the same idea where he's playing E and then the third and the seventh on top. And then to A. So all you have to do is move that third and seventh down a half step and they flip, right? The seventh's on top now and the third's underneath it. Same thing with the voice leading on piano. If you're doing some thirds and sevenths, like shells, things like that in your left hand, it's the same thing. You just move it down a half step. Same thing here, right? Actually, this very last bar, I put a mistake in there. That's the normal rhythm that's happening. But Ray actually does something like this. Before they start like getting into the swing. Uh, but that's what's happening up to this. So let's try this out. Uh, kick the metronome back on. So try it with me, alright? One, two, one, two, three.
get in some of the walking line. That was some of his walking line and some of my own. Um, but uh, if you're if you're a bass player and you've not checked out a lot of blueses too, start here with this album. I mean, it's so swinging. Transcribe this bass line. I was even considering like next week we'll get into his walking bass line because it's so swinging. Great note choices. Of course, everybody, you know, like all modern, you know, upright bass players that are in the jazz idiom have checked out Ray Brown. So if that's new to you, here's a good album to start with, okay? So let's try this, uh, let's try this last eight bars. And again, this is the segue. This is not heading back into the melody. This is the way into the solos, okay? But let's check it out. One, two, one, two, three. sense cool so that's the that's the overall vibe that's happening at the um, at the beginning of the track so that's Ray doing the whole melody again he's doing the he's doing the head like one time just just Ray Brown then the drums are coming in the next time and they build into the the swinging section they hit uh, after after they do that modulation E A D 7 then they go into that G blues and everybody's in everybody's hitting at that point so let's try the whole melody a few times through try to get it to feel good now I started off with everything more or less at tempo. They're about at that at that tempo we're at with the metronome. But let's slow it down a little bit and see if we can make it feel good slower, okay? So I'm gonna cut this down. Let's see how much. What if we set it at 60? And to try to make that feel good. That, that could be a challenge. So again, we wanna hear this. And inside of all of these beats too, I wanna hear that the quarter note, of course, but maybe some triplet. Triple the triple the triple the triple the triple the da 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 So when you're playing, you know, I think it's really important to um, to be able to hear hear what it is you want to do. Don't just stick your fingers on the bass and expect it to make something that's swinging. You know, you have to like be able to hear that rhythmically. And your note choices, knowing what note's coming up next in your mind is going to help you to be able to put it on the bass. So that's super key. So let's try just that first four bars really quick and try to make it feel good at this new tempo. Again, we're at 60, which is a little bit slower than the, the original, right? Let's try it. So one, two, one, two, three, four. Did you do it feels different right already that's got like a different pocket to it going at that tempo um, but I definitely encourage you to do that like if you're if you're playing something faster too and it feels okay slow it down see if you can make it feel good slower it's always gonna trip you up everybody thinks that you know we want to jump up into the hemisphere playing stuff fast but um, and that's important too of course um, so maybe we should do that on this too see if we can't bump up our tempo and go the other direction now so we were at 80. Let's throw it on 100 and see what that feels like. Nah, it's going to be different. I've not done this before, so we're just going to do this. But if we practice it and we shed it at this tempo too, I think it has something, it, uh, you know, really when we bring it back to the tempo where it sits better at, we're going to feel it in a different way. It's kind of like if you've ever... Uh, practice a lot of odd time signatures and then go back to playing in four you're like oh man this is fun you know to be back in four and not have all this anyways that's a personal opinion same with keys like if you're if you're used to playing a blues in b flat but you've been shedding d flat for like the last you know weeks 
and you go back to B flat and you're like, dang, okay, this feels right. Same idea, let's see if that happens here in this case. All right, so this is faster, play lighter, just relax. I'm telling myself that, all right? One, two, one, two, three. for that song <laughs> that just does not feel right at all <laughs> but it was fun it was a fun experiment what if we bump this back down to 80 and see what this feels like now one two one two three four That's why that tempo was chosen. Let's so let's shed a little bit more on that last that last turnaround too, where we're going E7 to A7 to D7, and see what that feels like. All right, and if you're just joining us too, because I know we have a lot of people like coming in uh, later, I want to do a shout out real quick to OpenStudioJazz.com, who uh, is putting up a lot of great sales right now. They're in preparation for Black Friday, so you can check out my new course, which is the Building Blocks of Bass. Look at me right there. Look how happy I am. Beautiful. You check out the building blocks of bass. It's usually at, um, at a certain price, but it's choose what you want to pay. Choose what you pay. There's specific wording on that. And I'm going to get it wrong. But head over to the website, click the link down below, and you can get it at a really good deal uh, leading into Black Friday. Okay, And that's the same with Christian McBride's great course, his two courses. Your sound is your signature and the fundamentals of jazz bass. I mean, Go buy those. Go buy those for sure. Obviously, Ruben Rogers has some amazing courses too, but I think all the courses on OpenStudioJazz.com uh, have this going on right now. So head over there, check that stuff out. Okay? So let's shed this last little bit and then we'll jump into the comments, okay, and see what's up, okay? So let's do the turnaround. So this is what I'm talking about is this how we're getting into that G blues coming up. All right? So let's shed this just a minute. One, two, one, two, three. Now, what if we move that around? So this is coming to mind right now. What if we move that concept around? We thought about, like, next we're getting G, right? So the third and seventh on top, we would just lower that down another half step. So we were coming from D7, right? But we can get to G. And that same kind of concept is there, right? So the third and seventh, you could sh shoot this up an octave too. So if I was trying to, instead of playing F and B, now I'm thinking a G7 chord right now, right? If I wasn't clear about that. But you could change that to where you've got a B on top. kind of an idea. You have to watch the intonation obviously, but that's the idea there. So if that's in G, what about in C? That's E on top and B flat on the bottom. Or the B flat and E up here. But grabbing the lower note's going to be a challenge, right? always kind of slide into that too, give it a little bluesy vibe that way. F7. So we 
could move that around in different keys, actually through a blues, it's perfect because those sevenths, you know, those dominant chords moving in fourths really kind of just lay well on the bass. So you'll hear a bunch of people doing that, of course. And again, if you flip that up, instead of an E flat on the top, put an A on the top, then that gets you, you know, in, into a different register. So depending on what key you're in, that's really going to play a part in where you would put something like this. So that's a few of the things, you know, inside of Blues in the Basement that I think are really important to check out, like from a bass player's perspective. Maybe not so much the double stops. You know, we don't do that a bunch when we're, when we're being foundational, like accompanists, you know. That's not really, you know, what people are trying to hear. But the strong fundamental, you know, like hitting, hitting the root, especially on beat one, big time, preceding the next chord coming up either chromatically, like we noticed, getting to the A chord, or by a fifth. That's super common. People want to hear that, you know, behind them when they're playing. And it makes it just really clear to the listener, you know? So if you do, that's where you're going to head. If you do this, you're going to land there, right? So that's a big, big thing. And we've talked about chromaticism and stuff before. But inside of this, there's a bunch of stuff. Groove, moving that stuff by a half step, uh, that stuff. The double stops. And plus, uh, you know, People just like to hear that sometimes too. So, all right, that's blues in the basement. I'm gonna head over to the comments. Let me know what you got. All right. Yeah, and there's some good information down here as far as uh, what's going on with the uh, the Black Friday sales. What's up? Hey, what's up, Nick? You're back. Good to see you again. Two weeks for two. Awesome. You made it on time. My man. Thanks for being here as always. What else do you got to say? Hey, Mark, how are you? It's my buddy Mark. We were in the Christian McBride boot camp together. Yeah, great player. Good to see you, Mark. Okay, Nick, I knew somebody was going to comment about this. First time I heard YYZ on an upright. So I'll tell my, my YYZ story just really quick because it's not a huge one. But I uh, grew up just like loving Primus and Les Claypool. And, uh, and that's actually one of the main inspirations initially for playing the upright bass before I'd even really heard any jazz or anything like that. I saw Liz Claypool, of course, playing, you know, My Name is Mud on his bass, like the six string, you know, singing like insane lyrics and, you know, uh, Herb Alexander playing the, the drums like I'd never seen anybody play. Um, and uh, seeing Liz Claypool play the electric upright and... I don't think he, they, were, they weren't playing YYZ. He wasn't playing upright on YYZ, but at, I went and saw Primus like four or five times when I was in high school, and uh, they always played YYZ. I was like, hey, I know that song. <laughs> and then I heard the Rush version later. And I'm just going to say, I think I prefer the Primus version. Sorry, Rush. <laughs> Jeffrey Keys is going to kill me. Um, yeah, so... Oh, I don't want to mispronounce your first name. Malta? Malte? Hey, Bob, I'm a bit late today. Hey, thanks for coming, though. Hope you were inter interested in what we're talking about today. Okay, what's Dave got? Cool how those two tritones describe the one and the four just a half step apart. I like not working hard. Me too. I'm right there with you, Dave. But yeah, that's, it's, it's brilliant, right? Just the flipping of those octaves in the register. Um, and it's voice leading, right? Which what I don't think I even uttered those words, but that's basically what's going on, right? The thirds and sevenths here on a piano, when they're comping, they want to keep things close by, not going something like this. I mean, you could, you could, but that's a big, that's a big gap. Maybe for effect, that would be awesome. But that's right next door, right? So it makes it a little bit, and especially with the open strings, you don't have to move your, your left hand, except for the, that kind of stuff, right? So, but yeah, Dave, it's super cool, right? It's all right next door to each other. Okay, oh, Edelson, Edelson Sanchez. Do you mind the thumb position of your left thumb in order to get the intonation of the tritone, the D and G? How, like, what do I think about with my thumb? I haven't thought about it until you brought it up. Now I'm going to get all self-conscious. Um, so let me just do it and try not to think about it. It's kind of, it's kind of right next to the fingerboard. Uh, you don't, 
you know, that's not really going to work to keep it behind the neck, right? Because the, at least on my bass, the heel is right here and I can't quite get that. Um, trying to make sure I can see my hands here. You could maybe bring the thumb over the neck. So I know some cats are into that, like using the thumb to like hold down the string a little bit can make it easier to play, especially when you're going higher, higher uh, in the, on the bass, right? So, but for myself, it just kind of comes along on the side. I'm maybe lifting it up sometimes. How are you doing it? How are you finding it at home? Is the thumb getting like stuck behind the neck or what's going on there? Okay, seventh level of hell. <laughs> I like the upper register stuff. It's hip, right? Yeah. And of course you can do this on electric bass too. Those thirds and sevenths, you know, that's just, you know, that's, that's part for the course. If you're playing a chord like the root and then the seventh and the third. I mean it's cool as an effect it'd be really hard to do maybe on a in tune but <laughs> sorry I'm just getting silly now. Low blood sugar. I need some dinner. What's up Nick? Those tasty pentatonic lines. Yeah absolutely. Yeah yeah totally. Cool. And yeah, Mark already knows, man. Yeah, the walking on that is it. Absolutely. It's so swinging. Uh, where, where does he go? Where does he go? I forget where he's going. That's a whole thing in itself. We might have to do that next week, check out that walking line. Yeah. I think slowing it down is important until I'm playing in tune all the time and getting a really fat sound. Yeah. Dave is bringing it, is breaking it down. Beautifully said, man. And uh, yeah, practicing it slow. Now the sound portion, you know, we have to think about the low end, right? So we've got kind of a lot in the spectrum. What I'm sure Dave is like referring to as well here, you know. But on the recording too, I gotta say on these upper on these upper chords, it sounds like Ray, you know. And go check it out uh, if you've not heard it before. Of course, go check it out. But I think there's a little bit more of that um, guitaristic, maybe flamenco type. I was wondering if he did it with his thumb, but it'd be really hard to come back around. So that's why I'm thinking he's doing this. I think, but yeah, slowing it down to get the tone right and the, you know, the sound right is a good, good practice, of course. You know, I, I think I approached it from the, the sense that uh, the groove really has to be there as it's slowed down, which is, for me, that's always an important, important factor. Is it grooving when I'm playing slower? You know, if the tempo is slower, it's surely got to groove, you know, like we don't have a choice. Um, so, you know, feeling it at different, different tempos can really be enlightening. So, yeah. But thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Mark's got jokes. Orange, the new Black Friday. <laughs> right on. Yay, orange from open... St I, I'm just slow. I'm just slow. Orange from, like, the logo, right? Yeah, the new Black Friday. I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Patrick, what's up? Hey, welcome back, man. Thanks for the lesson, Bob, and the song was really groovy today. It was really fun. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's just a good, I mean, super, super bass nerdy, you know, that's what we're here for, right? So, all right, Alessandro. Hello. What's up, Alessandro? How are you? I like your avatar. It looks like a bass there. Sweet. Mario. Hey, Bob, just wanted to say hi. Great lesson as always. Thanks, Mario. Thanks for tuning in, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, Y'all let me know on the Facebook group too or in the comments what maybe we could cover in the future. If there's anything that we've done in the past that you want to expand upon more or just get into entirely, uh, I'm all for it. Um, okay, hold up. We've got a question as a, from a pianist. Zachary Williams, I have a question. As a piano player, do you have any pet peeves regarding playing with pianists or pianists comping during your solo? Um, any pet peeves? Hmm. I don't want to put it that way. I would like to put it as in, I like 
the piano player to be active, um, not in my lower register. I, and I say active, I don't mean over, you know, playing a bunch, but I mean active as in the same way that a uh, pianist might comp for a sax solo, you know? Like, don't, don't completely, like, stop comping or just give me, you know, um, way less. In the same sense as the drummer, you know, I don't really... F I don't prefer a drummer to like lay out entirely or go to the hi-hat thing, you know, or the clicking on the side of the thing. It's all situational though, okay? But for, from, uh, from a bass player's soloing point of view, what I would like to hear from a pianist um, is just outlining the chords really well, maybe not implying any other, oh, hey, Stella's here. Do you have an ice cream after this? Do I have ice cream after this? No, we're actually doing it right now. Do you want to say hi? Yep. Everybody, this is Stella. She's saying hi. I'm almost done, actually. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Stella Um uh, <laughs> So, um, what was I saying? Yeah, register is a big one. Don't go too low. Don't, like, hop into the range that I might be playing in. Um, and listen where the bass player is playing in their register, too. Because if I'm playing down here, that could influence where you're putting your comping or your... Uh, not comping, whatever. If I'm playing higher, you know, if I'm playing way up in the stratosphere, then you would want to perhaps move around too, or I would want a pianist to move around too. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, options, and I know that Adam and um, Peter Martin had a had a talk on this not that long ago. She already left. Mommy's coming to check on Stella now. Um, so um, yeah, so. Uh, what was I trying to say? So pet peeves, really volume. So notice, and this is the same for drummers. Notice that we are not in the same spectrum as like we can't get as loud as a drummer or a pianist, even if they're amplified playing a keyboard. So that's a big thing. Um, and honestly, just, you know, don't try to imply other maybe chord changes that I'm not doing or try to change things or answer a bunch. I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's a long conversation, but I like things that are supportive, as in I was just being a bass player supporting perhaps the piano solo. I would like the other instrumental, instrumentalists to be there supporting me and interacting as well, but tastefully. So, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that was, you know, stayed pretty close to on, on topic there. But uh, let me know, Zachary. You know, is that some stuff that you think about? Okay. Dave, putting the thumb near the heel helps me keep that E7 tritone in tune. Yeah. So, talking about this, Dave, keeping that back there. But really, moving that up a half step, too. Dave, if you're still here, do you prefer two and three? Or are you doing one and two in the left hand? Because that would make a difference, too, in how and Edelson as well. That would make a difference, I think, in, in how your left hand is staying put or not. You know? So, yeah, but good call for sure. Yeah, all right, right on. You're always welcome. We'll be back every Monday, okay? All right, open strings are great for tunes like Haitian fight song, bass folk song. Yeah, yes, indeed. We're talking about Mingus and some Stanley Clark, huh? Nice, I love it. Thanks, Scott, yeah. that I'm doing my bad Mingus impersonation yeah it's got I love it though yeah Stevie the dog hey Stella she says hey of course she's always happy to be on Dave says hi I'll let her know I'll let her know okay so we've got another one from Anthony hi Bob really enjoying your lessons thank you just found them a week or so ago great that's awesome I'm a piano player new to upright bass less than one year thank you yeah hey thank you Anthony welcome glad you found us um, so, um, yeah, you can, you can always go to uh, the YouTube channel, Open Studios YouTube channel, and see any of our previous ones. I don't know how many of these we're up to now, under 20, over 10, something like that. But um, if you're new to the upright bass, you know, I have to say, like, I've got a course out on Open Studio Jazz that really uh, tries to focus on, from the ground up, what we're trying to do on the upright bass, like from how to stand, how to hold the bass, how to balance the bass, how to get a good sound, 
good time, intonation, building bass lines. Uh, you can head over there now and there's a free lesson up about walking bass lines and introducing triplets there. So if you click the link down below, um, and then also, of course, there's the, the Black Friday sale going on. So if you've thought about my course or any of the courses, you know, on, on Open Studios website, now is probably a good time to go check that stuff out. Okay. So ice cream sounds great there too. You got it. Walter. Absolutely. I hope we have some ice cream afterwards. B. Thompson. Thanks. I'm progressing. I'm making progress since coming to these sessions. Hey, dude, that, that's beautiful. I'm so glad to hear that. What else can we do? What else can we talk about in making progress? What do you want to talk about here? Helps to know the piano also with these half-step reversals. Ah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And that just goes back to the, to the voice leading, you know? It's super important to, to at least have a concept of that, too. Uh, you know, we have some piano players on today, which I think is really cool. Um, it's all music. Like, however we say it, as a bass player, I need to be able to hear what the pianist is doing, you know, as far as doing those shells and doing you know, uh, good voice leading, things like that, what's being said, and vice versa. So, um, and I got to say, too, that was a really pertinent question. Um, what do you, as a bass player, what do I want to hear from a piano player? Those are the type of questions, just even asking questions like that makes me want to play with you, okay? So, like, being, having awareness and being sensitive, of course, and just being aware that, um, that you know, we're all in it together, you know what I mean? So... I think that's a uh, I think that's a really cool comment, and uh, hopefully that's a um, that's what you're you're talking about there. So, uh, oh, Dave wrote. I'm going to do just a couple more, and then I'll let you go, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> so Dave said, I started doing one and two in left hand, then went to three and four when I saw you. The thumb idea is just to be in touch in the curve of the neck, not all the way back in the heel. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and I do the same thing. It's just kind of like anchored there, you know? That's, that's how I feel it. I think two and three makes the most sense to me. But you could do it either way, for sure, you know? Cool. Hey, Chris is here. Quick hello from YYC. You could probably do YYZ on a fight if you voted. We'll get into that. Yeah, we'll figure that out, right? Cool. Okay, oh, and Zachary is back. Thanks for the tips. My old director always gave me the death glare when I comp during any bass solo. Never allowed it at all. For real? That's crazy. Um, so I never got any experience in doing it until recently. Oh, band directors. Um, I'm sure that person meant well. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, because we're trying to leave sonic space for the bass, right? Oh, that's not a good to say about it. Sonic space for the bass. Um, yeah, we want to stay. The bass is hard to hear, especially if the bass is, is soloing down low. And, you know, if the bass was soloing down low, playing open type of voicings in the upper register on a piano would probably suit that really well, you know? So, yeah, but that's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, a different answer is to listen to recordings, right? Listen to how, you know, uh, famous piano players are comping over bass solos, and I'm sure you have before, but a lot of that is the answer. Listen to how Wynton Kelly plays behind Paul Chambers, you know? Listen to how Red Garland played behind Paul, Paul Chambers, you know? Listen to Benny Green with Ray Brown. Listen to Oscar, how does Oscar uh, comp behind Ray when he's soloing? So all of that, I think, is a, um, um, you know, that's, that's all legit. Like, what you hear on recordings, that's, that's likely close to the truth. Edelson, not likely close to the truth. I don't know why I'm talking about. That's the truth. I mean, if you're listening to Oscar Peterson and Ray Brown, that's the truth. Uh, I use third and fourth on the tritone, but searching a stable position. You use your pinky up there. Is that what you mean, Edison? I wouldn't rec. I wouldn't. If that works for you, that's that's it. That's really cool. I would not recommend uh, to any bass player to play a pinky any higher, really, than than like the F sharp. But, you know, it can be done, of course. But I don't know if that's the... Uh, yeah, is that what you mean, though? You're using third and fourth up there. Cool. If it works, that's what I'm saying. All right, pick and stone, and then I'm going to bounce, okay? So I asked this to Peter and Adam. I'm not a bass player, but I feel like us non bassists got to show some love. That just made all of these sessions for me. That's awesome. Thanks, pick and stone. 
So, what would be your top bass solos to transcribe for us non-bass players? Woo! Hey, I like that question. Um, top bass solos to transcribe for us non-bass players. I don't know. I don't know. I would, I would say first, um, before solos, I would say bass lines, you know, like transcribing Paul Chambers, transcribing uh, Wilbur Ware, or transcribing, um, you know, Israel Crosby. Because a lot of times it seems like other instrumentalists, uh, sax players, which I've given lessons to sax players, guitar players, pianists, where they're asking about bass, bass line, you know, how to build a bass line. And, um, and that's really what comes up first and foremost. I mean, great bass solos uh, um, to, to transcribe, you know, on a piano? I, I, don't, I don't know. Anything Paul Chambers plays is brilliant, though. Um, you know, so it, Whims of Chambers. Go check that out. I think that would be enlightening from another instrumentalist to go play that. But I usually go the other way. I, um, I usually transcribe more horn players or piano players, um, personally. But, uh, you know, there's, there's just so much good stuff out there course you know oh I was just transcribing some Christian McBride on that red cross you know the album with uh, uh, with uh, Roy Hargrove and uh, Stephen Scott called Parker's Mood I would love to hear that on a piano that would be super cool it's all bebop you know it's that's that's what I'm trying to say too is that it's all music whatever instrument you're dealing with you know so okay all right oh okay we got some clarification on the, the fingers Yep, two and three. Yep, absolutely, Edelson. Yep. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, I would love to hear about this. Harvey S. Nice. Um, I haven't heard enough of him. And I believe this entirely. <laughs> uh, yeah, so very cool. Hey, Fernando, what's up? There is a PDF. You can cl click the link down below, and uh, you should be able to find it um, down there. If you have any trouble with it, just let me know, though, okay? Yeah, and yeah. All right, so I got to get going. Thank you so much, everybody, for checking this out. Uh, it's always fun. I love doing the sessions. Please join the Facebook group if you're interested. Um, please leave me comments. I'll check them all out. Um, head on over to OpenStudioJazz.com, of course, before Black Friday sales end. It's a great time to head over there and get some information from some of the masters. Um, and, I mean, from a bass player's point of view, go check out Gregory Hutchison's courses. Check out the rhythm section courses, you know, like all great information. Doesn't have to just be bass, but anyways. All right. Until next time, happy practicing.